Remember to turn on all notifications so you don't miss a video. It's been a long time since I've watched Avatar The Last Airbender. At one point, it was even my number one cartoon. But now that I've become a story analyst and understand the science behind writing stories, I want to see if its quality still holds up or if I've been blinded by rose-tinted goggles. I already went through Teen Titans, the only western cartoon I believe can compete with it. Will it perform as well as Teen Titans or will it fall short of glory? Time to find out. You know I write with a scalpel because my penmanship is surgical. The first episode starts with the iconic narration, but the second half is different than what it will be for most of the story, seeing as Aang hasn't been introduced. This is a nice detail. Overall, I would have preferred a dope theme song like many cartoons had, but with this monologue, it would have been cool if it kept evolving as the story went on. For example, Toph and Zuko could have been added to the intro when they officially joined the group. The way the writers have characters naturally drop exposition about bending through an argument is great. The same can't be said for the next dialogue. When the two get into an argument, the dialogue is so awkward. It starts with Katara's outburst. She gets so angry so quickly and just lists negative character traits that Sokka is supposed to have. I don't think show don't tell applies to every situation, but it definitely does here. We are three and a half minutes into the show, but the intro is a minute and a half, so that's two minutes. We've barely seen either of the characters, so Katara naming these traits isn't her reiterating what's already been shown, and she starts complaining about more things we haven't seen and not so subtly sneaks in the death of their mom. It's her telling the audience and it just feels so clunky. Pair that up with her outburst leading to them accidentally finding Aang and this is just not groovy. Zuko and Iroh's dialogue is much more natural in comparison. If this had the same level of smoothness as the last scene, Zuko would have said, Look uncle, is the Avatar. Father burned my face for lacking honor, but if I can bring him back, father will finally unbanish me and I can restore my honor. But instead, his words are a little vague to us because he doesn't need to be specific when talking to his uncle who already knows all the details. He says, My search. We don't know what that means, but Iroh does. He also says it has to be him. Only once he gets enraged does he specifically say I need to capture the avatar. He also doesn't say why because Iroh already knows. Overall the animation has been really dynamic and fluid. The siblings different reactions to Aang shows off their main traits. Katara is nice and Sokka is cautious. That's good. See, when Katara calls Sokka paranoid here, it's just a reinforcement, not an establishment of that trait. We saw him poke from a distance, ask a bunch of questions, and assume that he was with the Fire Nation. Then she called him paranoid. Also, Katara and Sok make a great duo due to their contrasting personalities. Apart from the scene that I criticized, their chemistry is solid. Appa chooses not to fly. Zuko and Iroh also have great chemistry. Zuko is established as being hot-headed and obsessed with honor, while Iroh is established as a relaxed mentor figure. Zuko adds some more details to his backstory and motivation when he says, Their honor didn't hinge on the Avatar's capture. Mine does. It's natural and makes the audience want to know more. Aang lying about not knowing the Avatar is great writing. Later we learned that being the Avatar caused him to be isolated and he ran away from the role, which is what led to him being trapped in the iceberg. So him denying the role of the Avatar is a great and consistent decision. When the group sleeps, Aang has a flashback slash nightmare of him freezing himself. It's not the smoothest exposition, but the fact that it was a nightmare makes it acceptable. The airbending exposition is smooth because Aang is given an audience surrogate, people who are as clueless as the audience. Those are the villagers. Zuko's training is the first time we see any fighting and bending used as a weapon. It has solid choreography. Iroh's exposition on firebending is also smooth because it's a teacher teaching a student. Even if Zuko should already know this, there's nothing unnatural about a teacher repeating their lessons when the student doesn't show progress. This scene also establishes Iroh as a potential formidable force since he is presumably a better bender than Zuko, judging by the fact that he's the teacher. Zuko and Iroh's conflict once again shows off their character traits well. Zuko's hot-headed, Iroh's calm. Zuko telling Iroh what he already knows comes off as natural because he's using it as an argument as to why he shouldn't be doing the simple drills. Smooth. Iroh's comedic side is shown at the end of the scene. Sokka teaching the kids and mentioning their fathers at war is more smooth exposition. Aang continues to show off his childish nature. The exposition about Aang's only element, Katara being the only bender, and the North Pole is all smooth because both of them don't know about the other. It also starts the overarching goal of the season, finding Katara a master. I notice that they keep saying Fire Navy. I could be wrong, but I don't remember this term being used in any other season. We get good exposition when Aang realizes he's been frozen for a hundred years. Aang's childish and curious nature finally bites him when he goes into the Fire Nation ship despite Katara's warning and triggers a signal. This allows Zuko to find them and the village. This episode was just okay. I believe it's supposed to be a two-parter, but as a standalone, it's boring. It's like watching a movie and stopping right after the inciting incident. Some of the exposition was good, some was not. The characters are decent so far. The world building is good, but there are no themes so far. In episode 2, we get the main intro. 
The villagers have a reasonable reaction to Aang's negligence. I like how Katara is given a difficult choice. Choose the tribe or choose the newbie who can bring her to a teacher. Initially, she's emotional and chooses Aang, but Aang convinces her to stay. This is the second time Appa refuses to fly. This builds up anticipation for when he finally does. Katara snapping at her grandma over losing a chance at waterbending shows her selfishness. I don't know if it was intentional yet. The parallels of Sokka and Zuko getting dressed for battle is cool. A Fire Nation ship arrives and Zuko walks out. The armor and masks the nation wears look sick. Sokka attacks and my appreciation for this show plummets. Bathos is basically when a serious moment is interrupted by comedy. It's almost never a good thing. This will be a recurring problem for Avatar. Sokka is constantly going on about warrior this, warrior that. And he's even given an epic suit up scene with Zuko. But when it comes time for action, he's too shotted in a goofy way. Zuko doesn't even bend. Not only is this a hit on Sokka's character, it's a hit on the dramatic nature of the Fire Nation. The South Pole men are at war with these people and Katara's mom died to fire soldiers. But when the story finally gets a chance to show how scary they are, we get bathos. This decreases how seriously I view the nation. That was a fumbled opportunity right there. We could have seen how competent Sokka was and how dangerous the nation is, but nah, we get a joke instead. Sokka comes back for round 2, but it's mostly jokes again. There's a little bit of seriousness on each side, but only a bit. The fight ends with comedy. Then Aang shows up and makes Zuko look like a clown with his helmet falling on his butt. I like Sokka thanking Aang for returning. It's a small detail, but it shows that he's not stuck in his ways. But the bathos is killing me. I don't want to hear it's a kid's show. Not only is this argument garbage, but it goes against what the show will become. In the future, this kid's show tackles several serious and dark topics and gives them the gravitas they deserve. I'm just asking for that treatment to be given here. These poor decisions also go against good writing. If you want the audience to fear a character or a group, you can't have their first confrontation be pure jokes. That's common sense. Look at Teen Titans. Imagine if Slate's first fight had him beating up the Titans in a silly way or being silly himself. It'd be hard for the audience to take him seriously. Furthermore, the comedy could at least still be funny if it's going to ruin potentially great moments, but it's not. I like Avatar, I swear, but I'm also capable of being critical. Aang's decision to give himself up is a great moment that shows that he values the safety of innocent people. This is the midpoint, a false defeat. The moment of Aang leaving Katara could have actually landed for me if most of the action leading up to that point wasn't goofy. In reality, it falls flat. I also love Sokka preparing to save Aang without Katara's influence. Once again, it shows that he's flexible and capable of acknowledging when he's wrong. That's a character arc right there. So far, he's one of the show's highlights, so it's unfortunate that in combat, he's treated like a joke. This is the first time the two siblings get along. Then Granny also changes her mind and supports them. The art and animation when Aang starts fighting looks great. I like the bird's eye fish I shot. I also like Aang's creativity in battle. Sokka the Don Believer, being the one to get Appa to fly, was hype and poetic. The music building up as he approached Aang's correct phrase was excellent. The build up of Appa not flying allowed this moment to be exciting. During Aang's fight, we see that airbenders have access to speed. The slight fisheye when Aang hops over his opponent and frees himself on his helmet looks great and the action is creative. Arrow sleeping during this shows his relaxed nature. Notice how no one had to tell me he's relaxed or lazy. Aang and Zuko have a rematch and is thankfully taken more seriously. The animation is decent, but Zuko looks so incompetent. He can't land a single hit. Aang also introduces his air scooter. And then Aang too shots him in a silly way once again, once he gets his staff. This does a good job of showing that Aang is stronger with his staff, but it's bathos again. Aang's low number of attacks also suddenly highlights his pacifist nature. They have round 3 and now Aang is suddenly incompetent and he gets bested by Zuko. In the water, Aang enters the avatar state and defeats all the soldiers with waterbending. Aang specifically said that he only knew airbending. This shows us that Aang can use different elements in the avatar state. Zuko is hanging onto the staff when Sokka goes to retrieve it. So the latter pokes him off the same way Zuko did when they first fought, causing him to let go. Bathful strikes again. When the other guards get up, Katara uses her sloppy bending to freeze them. Iroh's laziness is shown when he wakes up after the heroes are already leaving, but his competence is shown when he and Zuko try to shoot them down. In the following action, Aang explains that he never wanted to be the Avatar. This is a fascinating concept, a chosen one hero who doesn't want to be the chosen one. The group decides to go to the North Pole together so Aang and Katara can learn waterbending. Aang shows his childishness when he prioritizes riding animals over mastering the four elements. A small detail is that most of the animals in this story seem to be hybrids of two different animals. That's the end of the two-parter. This was rough, buddy. I'll begin with the positives. Most of the characterization was good, meaning we understood their personalities well. Sokka had a character arc. Zuko and Iroh had a great dynamic. Katara and Sokka had an okay dynamic. The animation consistently looked great, sometimes reaching Sakuga levels. The action scenes were decent, and the world building was interesting. So far, Zuko, Iroh, and Sokka are my favorite characters. Considering that Aang and Katara are the mainest, I don't think this is the writer's desired result. The negatives. Way too much bathos with comedy that isn't even good. There are barely any moments that have appropriate gravitas, even in scenes that were supposed to be dramatic. 
clunky exposition at the start was painful. The plot was very uneventful and felt like a lot of loitering. There was no theme in either episode. These episodes had two primary writers and three additional writers. How do you have so many people on the team and this is the best you could come up with? Hopefully the season at least has half of the episodes be of the quality I'm expecting from a story of this stature. There are 20 episodes in this season. I hope at least 10 are solid. Right off the bat, the visuals look amazing. There are slight bloom effects throughout this episode. Katara hints that the Southern Air Temple might not be the same way Aang last saw it, but he's still excited anyway. Zuko wants to keep the Avatar a secret so he can keep the glory, but then Zhao, Zuko's rival for the season, shows up all inquisitive. The comedy here is actually funny. I must remind you that I love Zuko and Iroh. The animation is incredibly smooth and reminds me of Naruto's smoothest scenes. Also, Iroh is called a general, which is higher than captain or commander, hinting at his high level of skill. Katara tries to prepare Aang again, showing her kindness, but Aang is just way too optimistic. Zuko and Zhao's dynamic is wonderful. Zuko tries to avoid Zhao's prying, but Zhao's men interrogated Zuko's men and discovered the truth. Meanwhile, the crew finds the Southern Air Temple. When Aang gets sad that everyone's gone, Sokka shows his kindness by playing one of Aang's old games. When the siblings find a Fire Nation mask, Sokka wants to tell him, but Katara hides it. Katara wants Aang to feel good, while Sokka wants Aang to hear what he needs to hear. Some would say this is the difference between being nice and being kind. There's a flashback of Aang and Gyatso. We see the temple when it was alive and Aang doesn't want to be the Avatar. Zhao forcefully takes over Zuko's operation. With the crew, the exposition of the Avatar cycle and reincarnation is smoothly delivered by them looking at the statues and noticing the pattern. The animation when Aang chases Momo looks amazing. The camera angles and the animated backgrounds really make this scene stand out. Avatar might easily have the best visuals out of any western cartoon because they really border on anime levels. Through Zhao's insults to Zuko, we learn that Zuko is a prince that was banished by his father. We also learned that the Avatar is Zuko's ticket back home. Smooth exposition. Zuko challenges Zhao to an Agni Kai. In Iroh's dialogue and the visuals suddenly inform us that the last time Zuko was in an Agni Kai, his face was burned. Through the chase, Aang finds the corpses of Firebenders and Gyatso. Aang enters the Avatar state, which lights up the statues and sends a signal all across the world that the Avatar is back. During Zuko vs Zhao, the iconic fighting song plays. The art and animation look good, but the choreography leaves much to be desired. I can't really tell what's going on in the fight due to the directing at least at the start. When Iroh reminds Zuko about the basics, the fight levels up. Zhao knocking Zuko down, Zuko's breakdance three-peat, and eventual victory look pretty good. The main issue with this fight is the directing. We rarely see both characters on screen at the same time. It'll show a cut of A attacking alone, and then a cut of B reacting alone, rather than A and B attacking and reacting in the same frame and cut. Zuko's recovery was one of the few scenes that showed both at the same time, which is part of what made it look so good. Zuko's refusal to burn Zhao, like he was burned, shows that there's some good in him. Zhao tries to burn Zuko while he's walking away, but Iroh stops him, showing a glimpse of his elite nature. Zuko wanted to fight back, but Iroh stopped him and gave him wise words before insulting Zhao. Zuko is happy that his uncle called him honorable. Before this fight started, they said the Avatar was 12, which he is, but how did they know that? Back with the crew, Katara tries to talk Aang out of his anger. The shot of him covered in shadows, with his eyes glowing through, looks epic. Katara says that Sokka and her are his new family and he calms down. Aang wants to know how he can talk to Roku, the avatar before him. This is a setup. The lemur brings Sokka food, which he's been requesting since the beginning of the episode. Momo joins the group. This episode was solid. Everything with Zuko and Iroh was phenomenal, and they carried this episode. The two remain as my favorite characters. I never thought this before, but I honestly think the show could have worked if they were the protagonist and Aang and his crew were the B-plot. Aang's plotline was uneventful, but the maturity towards the end was great. I like how they set up his eventual explosion in anger by having him be overly optimistic despite Katara's warnings. There was more world building but still no theme. Zuko and Iroh are a funny duo and they can't track the Avatar, but it's because Aang doesn't know where he's going. Aang trying to impress Katara is corny, but the comedy of her unsynced reactions is hilarious. I might get into this later, but I don't like the romance between them. When I was younger, I used to support any canonical ship, but anime like Nisekoi broke me out of that mold. Aang is like a middle school boy trying to impress a high school girl. It reminds me of Dipper and Wendy from Gravity Falls. Spoiler, but that relationship actually had a mature ending with Dipper having to realize that she doesn't see him in that way and that he's too young for her. I would have loved it if the same thing happened here. Sokka turns into the grandfather of Red Pill and starts, <laughs> and starts dropping his controversial opinions on gender roles. While the way he said it was rude, he's not completely wrong. I don't know if girls are better at sewing from a biological standpoint. I think that would be a cultural result. 
but guys being better at hunting and fighting is a biological fact. Then Katara gets mad because she can't handle the truth. When they land, Sokka's caution is shown. Aang's true reason for landing was to ride another hybrid animal. His dialogue shows that he's trying to impress Katara yet again. His deformed face when he realizes the water's cold is hilarious. The animation is really dynamic. Once Katara stops looking, Aang is disappointed. I'm telling you, middle schooler and high schooler. The animation is really goofy, but still high level when Aang starts running. I forgot the animation ever got like this. The group is captured by the Kyoshi warriors. After some of Sokka's red pill comments, we learn that Kyoshi was one of the past avatars and that Aang knows her. After Aang frees himself, he does his stupid marble trick and the crowd goes wild. That was funny. The news of the avatar's location goes from this island to the earth to the fire to Zuko. Y'all some snitches. Zuko and Iroh go after him after a comedic bit. Sokka is mad that he lost the girls, and the episode, like the first two, is gonna disrespect his combat skills again. At least Zuko earned some respect back when he beat Zhao. For Sokka, I don't think he becomes respectable in terms of competency until the last season. It's a tragedy, man. Meanwhile, Aang is having a Spider-Man 3 moment when he's soaking up all the attention. He's gonna have to learn that being a hero is not about attention, but the responsibilities. Katara starts getting jealous for no reason after curving the kid all day. This melodrama is awful. Sokka loses to the Kyoshi warriors, and Aang and Katara get into a petty argument. Why does Sokka always have to be the butt of the joke, and why are Aang and Katara so immature this episode? Katara has no reason to be jealous of a bunch of 10-year-old girls giving Aang attention. That's like Sailor Moon being jealous of her crush giving Chibi Moon attention, a literal 6-year-old. And then why does Aang have to rub it in? This seems out of character. Sokka apologizes and learns from the warriors. Aang continues to childishly get Katara's attention, and both are immature, so they continue beefing. Sokka gets one W when he one up Suki. Katara decides to be the bigger person and shows up for Aang's Unagi spectacle when all the other girls leave. They both apologize and the Unagi shows up. How did Aang black out from being thrown off the Unagi? Questionable. Katara saves him with some water bending, and then Zuko shows up. She water bends water out of his mouth to wake him up, but we didn't see him swallow any. The man blacked out as soon as he hit the water. The warriors attack the fire soldiers and Sokka saves Suki. That's another W. But how does a fan deflect fire? That makes no sense. Furthermore, in season 2, Azula specifically says that fans make flames stronger when she fights Suki. Zuko brings back his breakdancing and starts catching bodies. I'm noticing that he likes to breakdance. What's cool is that I believe his breakdance move is what allowed him to defeat Azula in the last season. Aang and Zuko fight again. The animation is decent, but Aang just one-shots him. Why do the writers keep making Zuko incompetent compared to Aang? Just like Sokka, he's a well-written character that isn't allowed to obtain significant victories in action. At least not often. Let them cook. Aang realizes that he brought this destruction to Kiyoshi Island, so the crew has to leave. How are the people with fans beating benders? That's hard to believe. Then Suki kisses Sokka before he leaves. Really? They just met this episode, and there's already a romance between them. That moved too fast. But I guess that's another win for Sokka. Katara says that Aang did the right thing by leaving, but Aang comes back with a third option. He spins the block and uses Chekhov's Unagi to spray the village, dazzling the fire as the main theme plays. That's another good song. This episode was a mixed bag. It only got good once Zuko pulled up. The rest was the main trio loitering once again, while acting extremely immature. All three got character arcs, but I didn't really like any of them. Aang is usually innocent and peaceful, but for some reason he started acting very selfish and antagonistic towards Katara. Katara hasn't exactly been mature up till now, but getting jealous of Aang and reacting in a petty way was beneath her, in my opinion. Finally, Sokka was legitimately saying facts at the beginning of the episode, but because some facts can be viewed as misogynistic, he has to be humbled and eliminate this behavior. The writers didn't want to acknowledge biological differences and took it out on the boy. Overall, I don't like this strategy of writing character arcs. The writers brought out a character flaw and then forced the characters to get rid of it. In Teen Titans, the writers often had the characters believing a lie and then learning the truth. I prefer this because it doesn't come at the cost of the character's likability. Aang and Katara were obnoxious in this episode. I don't know if there's a theme. In Teen Titans, the arc the characters went through was the theme, but here, there are three different arcs and none of them play an important role in the climax. That climax was amazing though. It has Aang taking responsibility for his actions. So maybe the theme was, take responsibility for your job and your mistakes. The crew goes to Omashu. I remember I used to think that they only visited one of the four nations each season, but in the first season, they visited water, air, and earth so far. This is the first time we see earthbending. For some reason, Kyoshi Island had no earthbenders. The world building of how earthbending is used in Omashu structure is really cool. Young Boomy is shown in a flashback. I like the freeze frame when the crew is riding around. Avatar occasionally has some unique comedy and I appreciate that. This entire idea of writing the mailing system shows how immature Aang is. He caused a lot of destruction for his own amusement. 
wasn't the theme of the last episode about taking responsibility? The cabbage man has his cabbages ruined twice. When the crew's brought to the king of Omashu, the old man has the same left eye and skin color as Bumi, which is a hint to his identity for attentive viewers. Bumi quickly exposes Aang as an airbender in the Avatar. He knows because Aang and him were friends 100 years ago. Bumi forces Aang to go through challenges while holding his friends hostage. When Aang gets to choose his opponent, he thought he outplayed Bumi by choosing him. But who'd have thought that the leader of an earthbending society would be an earthbender? He had two non-benders to choose from. Bumi says that avoid and evade is a typical airbender tactic. We've seen Aang do that a lot, and I even mentioned it once. Smooth exposition. The camera angle when Bumi punched the floor looked cool, but other than that, the usual problems are still present. Both characters rarely share the screen. Bumi turning earth into sand is an interesting application. So is Aang creating a tornado to reverse an attack. After the fight, Bumi turns into Rumpelstiltskin and asks Aang to figure out his name. The theme of the episode is, think outside the box, and that was conveyed well. The episode ends with the two riding the slides and ruining cabbages. This episode was mediocre. I like the theme and the world building, but the plot was lame, and Zuko wasn't here to bring up the episode. The painted backgrounds look really good. Sokka's hunting skills are questionable, and his cautious nature is shown again. When they find Haru, Sokka wants to be cautious again, but Katara just goes up to him. The Fire Nation is in control of this Earth village. This is the first time we've seen this. Exposition is delivered smoothly because the crew is the audience surrogate. The economy between fire and earth is developed. Earthbending is forbidden in the village. This will definitely come up later. Katara starts relating to Haku because they are both benders and had a parent taken away by the Fire Nation. The compositing when Haru and Katara are in the sunset looks stunning. That's something you usually only see in anime. Haru can also turn rock to sand. Katara tells Haru about how her necklace was from her mother. When Haru uses earthbending to save an old man, his pose looks similar to Bumi's when he lifted the giant rock, especially the thumb and index. Sokka is being cautious again, but he becomes the butt of a joke, again. The old man's name is apparently Judas because he snitches on Haru for saving his life. Katara has apparently gotten better at waterbending when she learns Haru's been taken. The bloom is heavy here. Katara comes up with a small plan, but Aang's childishness shows once again. He thinks that this is fun. The animation during the plan to Sakuga. It's so expressive for no reason, and the acting is so bad. This scene is hilarious though. Aang being distracted and the earthbending lemur are classics. Katara is taken to a shipyard as a prisoner. The warden's monologue informs us that earthbenders can't bend metal. This will be important in season 2 as well. Haru's father, Tyro, has given up on fighting back, unlike when he got captured in Haru's story. Katara tries to give a motivational speech, but no one cares. Aang and Sokka come to save her, but she won't leave until everyone is free. This is her kindness again. Sokka is cautious and fights back, but he eventually agrees. The warden arguing with his soldiers was funny. The comedy is finally improving. Sokka comes up with a clever plan to bring the cold to the earthbenders so they can fight back. The cinematography during the explanation was good. The warden says, you're one mistake away from dying where you stand. That's an alternative version of the word die. I vividly remember other episodes avoiding the word kill, like the plague. But they're allowed to say die? That's strange. When cold is brought, the earthbenders are so broken that they don't fight back. Haru was initially stopped by Tyro, but he decides to take action, and Tyro joins in to protect his son. An earth versus fire battle breaks out, Sokka actually shows some competency. Aang uses his wind tunnel, and Tyro drops the ops into the sea. The prisoners leave the ship, and Haru starts macking on Katara, making her blush. Catch up Aang. <laughs> Haru wants Katara to join him, but she can't. Then she realizes her necklace is gone. Zuko the goat picks it up, and the episode ends. This episode was good. The first half was weak, and the second half was strong. The theme is never lose hope. The jailbreak concept was interesting, but season 3 runs it back and does it much better. This is the first multi-part episode. Aang is childish and jumps through clouds. He says it's mostly made of water. That comes up in a future episode. The crew finds a destroyed forest and Aang blames himself for some reason. Zuko and Iroh have another comedic bit, with Iroh being relaxed and Zuko being uptight. These two are national treasures and are carrying the story so far. The voice acting is also phenomenal in this whole cartoon. Sokka being cheered up by Aang getting hit by an acorn is hilarious. The acorn will come back. She says that acorns mean the force will grow back. The compositing in the old man's village looks wonderful. The crew learns about Heibai, a spirit that attacks a village at night and abducts people. We also learn that during the winter solstice, the natural and spirit worlds come close. This exposition also reveals that the Avatar is the bridge between the natural and spirit worlds. Aang needing Roku's guidance is brought up again. Sokka's pessimism is hilarious. 
Iroh gets captured by Earth soldiers, and they recognize him as the Dragon of the West. They call him Once Great. Iroh's legendary status keeps coming up. For the first time, Iroh's laziness bites him. Heibai shows up and wreaks havoc, ignoring Aang. Sokka tries to help Aang, but gets snatched. Aang chases after them. Meanwhile, Zuko uses his detective skills to learn that Iroh was captured. Aang and Heibai go to the spirit world, but the former doesn't know it yet. The night color palette helps hide this. This is the first time Aang goes to the spirit world. Ba Sing Se and Iroh's 600 day siege are brought up here. Iroh sneakily leaves a sandal behind for Zuko to track, which he does. Aang realizes he's in the spirit world and that he can't bend here. A spirit dragon comes and reveals that he's Roku's animal guide. Apparently Appa is Aang's and this is an avatar thing. What's interesting is that the sky bison and dragon are both the progenitors of airbending and firebending respectively. Iroh can see Aang and the dragon despite being in the natural world. This displays how spiritually in tune he is. Iroh uses his wish to take on the earthbenders and escape, but he's quickly captured. The comet is brought up for the first time. Aang learns that he'll be able to meet Roku on the solstice. That's a new mission for this season. Zuko being forced to choose between capturing the Avatar and saving his uncle was great writing. Zuko chooses Iroh, which shows that he doesn't place his honor above his uncle. When Zuko pulls up, the focus blur on the hand looks cool. Zuko and Iroh take the 2v5 like it's nothing. The animation looks good, but the framing issue still exists. This is the first time we see the Earth Soldier has been used as a shield. The B-plot ends here, The Heibai shows up again. Aang learns that Heibai is the forest spirit who's mad. He brings back the Chekhov's acorn to tell Heibai that the forest will return. He turns back into a panda and the abducted people return. When being thanked, Sokka shows his practicality by asking for supplies and money. I really like him. The crew needs to get to the crescent-shaped island, but the solstice is tomorrow and the island's in the Fire Nation. I like the overarching goal and the ticking clock. It means that they'll visit all four nations in the first season. This episode is okay. There's no theme, but the plot was pretty good. Once again, Zuko's plot was better, but the A-plot had a lot of interesting exposition and an antagonist that introduced an interesting perspective. This doesn't feel like a two-part episode because everything here was wrapped up. Katara, Sokka, the villagers, and Appa initially don't want Aang to go to the Fire Nation because it's dangerous, but they eventually accept it. Right after they leave, Zuko pulls up to terrorize the villagers, asking about Aang. He's using the clue he gathered from last episode. When Iroh and Zuko talk, we learn that Zuko is 16 and that the Fire Lord is strict. He's not allowed to return to the nation, so it's dangerous for him to chase the Avatar. This is an interesting conflict. Zuko is shooting at the crew, but a Fire Nation blockade shows up. After arguing, the crew and Zuko decide to go past it. Iroh tried to warn his nephew. Zhao is on the blockade and shoots at Aang, disregarding Zuko's safety. Appa weaves, but Zuko's ship is damaged. Despite this, he keeps pushing forward. Sokka almost falls and Aang destroys the ship, allowing them to pass. Zhao lets Zuko, who was gonna risk crashing, go through because he might lead him to the Avatar. This is the most intense the story has been. No bathos in sight. That's how I like it. On the Crescent Island, Aang fights the Fire Sages and shows off his super speed when escaping. One Trader Sage helps the crew find Rogu. Fire Lord Sozin is name dropped when the Sage is giving exposition. Then a new problem arises. A door is closed and it can only be opened by a mastered avatar or all sages. Sokka comes up with a plan. Meanwhile, Zuko decides to let his main ship be a decoy for Xiao to follow while he takes a smaller ship to find Aang. Sokka is extremely competent with his plan and mentions his father. The plan unfortunately fails. Katara makes a follow up plan using the fire marks to fool the sages into thinking they got in. This is really clever. The sages fall for it, but Aang is caught by Zuko, but he frees himself and enters in the nick of time. Aang meets Roku and Xiao shows up, having seen through Zuko's trick. Roku gives exposition about Sozin's comet. The comet started a war and Ozai will use it to end the war in summer. Aang is given a ticking clock. Defeat Ozai before the comet or there is no more hope. Then Roku's spirit in the Avatar state comes out to school the firebenders and free the prisoners. This is the first time we see the raw power of a full-fledged Avatar. The crew and Zuko escape. This was easily the best episode so far. While there was no theme, the plot was eventful and dramatic and the additions to the lore and overarching story were great. There was no funny business like bathos or immature characters. It also had Zuko and Zhao, my favorite rivals. Aang is freaking out about having under a year to master the elements. Katara offers to teach Aang what she knows. Meanwhile, Zuko and Iroh make a hilarious duo again. Iroh changed course to get a lotus tile and Zuko wasn't having it. While the waterbenders are training, Katara is getting a little salty at how quickly Aang is learning. But Aang is luckily mature this episode and makes her feel better by saying that he has a great teacher. How are you getting mad at the Avatar, the person supposed to master all four elements, the person who's been reincarnated several times, is learning bending faster than you? 
This maturity isn't enough when Aang can do moves that she can. This is gonna be like Yoshi Island again. You just practiced our supplies down a river was funny though. If Katara can somewhat waterbend, why has she rarely used it in battle? Also, she was garbage in the first two episodes, but now she has some moves. Was she practicing off screen? I feel like that's something that should be shown since it's important to the story. Aang spends some money on a bison whistle and Katara has to keep the money from now on. That bison whistle comes back, but Aang's immaturity in buying something like that when they're low on money is evident. Find a water scroll with the pirates and Katara steals it because she's broke. The two point perspective during the chase looked nice. Katara uses water bending in battle, bringing back the ice from episode 2. Cabbage Man is back for another gag. When they escape, Katara reveals she's a thief. Her justification is that the pirates stole it from a waterbender. Not a good excuse. Two wrongs don't make a right. Sakurai right fully criticizes her, but she says Aang has to learn waterbending. The Zuko B plot ties into the A plot when Iroh goes to the pirate ship and Zuko overhears a conversation about a bald monk. When Katara messes up her move, Sokka points out that her failure is deserved because she's only interested in teaching herself. When Aang gets the water whip, she snaps at him out of envy, proving Sokka right. It's rare to see Sokka in the right. I don't like the way the writers make the characters unlikable just to tell an arc, but in this episode, it's a little justifiable because seeing someone learn something faster than you would create envy in most people. But the usually kind Katara shouting at Aang just because he's better than her is a little out of character. She's snapped at Sokka, but only when he antagonizes her. Aang was trying to help. Once again, he's the avatar. Him learning faster should be expected. Sokka trying to extract more apologies is funny. Katara said she was done with the school, but at night, she took it back to practice. She's so insecure this episode. This causes the Fire Nation and Pirates to find her, and Zuko comes with quips. For the first time, Zuko tries to reason with her to get the avatar. He offers to return her necklace back. This doesn't work. Zuko threatens to burn the scroll if the pirates don't help him find Aang. The two guys get kidnapped. Iroh saying that it's Katara's fault is hilarious. I'm telling you, Zuko and Iroh are national treasures. Then Sokka, <laughs> then Sokka starts his Olympic gold medal instigating and gets the pirates and fire soldiers to turn on each other. The pirates decide to keep the avatar and the two sides fight. I'm just realizing this, but the Fire Nation has, has benders and non-benders. The guys with the masks can bend. The guys without masks hold spears. Zuko vs the Pirate King fixes my major issue with the fights. The camera is pulled back so that both fighters can be seen in the same frame as they exchange blows. Aang and Katara use one of the water bending moves they learned to move a ship and escape on it. Zuko and Iroh have another funny interaction before learning that their boat's been stolen. Aang is already good at water and Katara does a check off's water whip to beat a foe. Momo takes out a pirate bird while Sokka gets beat up. Why can't he fight? After being saved by Aang, he saves Aang back while he blows the check off's whistle. This makes up for before. The benders use water to stop the ship from falling down, but the other ships crash into them, pushing them off the edge. Appa saves them in the nick of time due to the whistle. Iroh finds the lotus tile and Zuko throws it. I love these two. Katara apologizes again and faces her flaw, but Sokka still has the scroll. I'm glad that the writers have the characters admit that stealing is wrong, because that was a red flag. A show with a young demographic shouldn't be encouraging stealing. I don't think any show should be, but especially not ones like this. She adds, unless it's from pirates, but I'll let it slide since it was comedic. This episode had two themes, stealing is wrong and don't be too competitive. Katara really took some L's here because she made both thematic mistakes. This episode was surprisingly good. It had great setups and payoffs, an interesting character arc, it was eventful, and it progressed the overarching plot. It's not as good as 8, but it's good. The episode starts with Momo getting caught in a trap and the crew freeing all the animals. Sokka effectively uses his boomerang to free two at once. This is the second time his boomerang skills have been put to use. Sokka's caution and tactical brain show when he notices the traps are Fire Nation and says no flying. Sokka says he's the leader, but Katara doesn't respect it. I think Sokka's right here. He's clearly the most cautious and smartest. Katara suggests Aang, but even Aang disagrees. Katara keeps using logical fallacies like, your voice cracks and you haven't kissed a girl. Hold on. She specifically got mad at Sokka for stereotyping boys and girls in episode 4, but here she says, why do boys always think someone has to be the leader? Hypocrisy. The crew is displeased while walking and mocks Sokka's instincts until they run into fire soldiers. Jet and his crew save them. They steal blasting jelly from the soldiers. Jet keeps stealing Sokka's enemies, so the latter doesn't like him. Jet also shows interest in Katara. The two later mock Sokka's instincts, making Sokka salty. It's tough being the leader. The followers always take it for granted. TMNT 2012 had an episode where the leader got sick of being the leader. So did the 2007 movie. The Katara Jet romance is made more explicit when they go to the hideout. Exposition tells us that Jet's group fights against the Fire Nation and will eventually drive them out. The nation also killed Jet's parents. It seems like, Kat <laughs> it seems like Katara falls for anyone who's lost parents to the nation. 
Sokka is still in a bad mood and he wants to leave the next day, but Jet keeps him around by saying that he needs him on a mission. Jet's a good manipulator. He keeps showering the crew with compliments to keep them around. Sokka uses his blade to hear if people are coming and Jet compliments him. It's nice to see Sokka be useful, but I'm telling you, Jet is a people person. Manipulative sounds too malicious, but he's good at making people feel good and like him. Sokka wants to pull back when he sees it's just an old man, showing that he has a regular morality, but Jet's gang harasses him, showing that they have a different moral code. Fire Nation equals bad. Sokka stops Jet from kicking him and the gang steals his stuff. Now, Sokka's rightfully salty and wants to go. Aang and Katara still like him. Sokka calls Jet your boyfriend when talking to Katara and she doesn't deny this. When they hear Jet's side, he says that he had a concealed knife with a poison compartment. He even thanks Sokka for saving his life. Manipulative. Sokka isn't having it and says that there was no knife. Jet says the nation is about to burn down a forest and they need the crew. Katara gets petty and says that Sokka's jealous that Jet's a better warrior and leader. Man, she is so unlikable sometimes. Half the time. At night, Sokka spies on the gang and sees them planning how to blow the dam, which will hit the earth town and kill innocent citizens. Jet says sacrifices have to be made and admits to lying about the forest fire. He's a full-on consequentialist. He gets his goons to keep Sokka away from his crew and lies to them later. Jet Smooth talks the two into helping him with water. Jet highlights that he wants to meet back up at the reservoir, not the hideout, but Katara chooses the hideout anyway. Sokka uses the Chekhov's traps to trap his two captures and escapes. While at the hideout, Aang realizes that the gang is going to use the blasting jelly they got to blow up the dam. Jet shows up to stop the two. Katara's in denial because she's too kind or in love, but Jet tells them the truth. Jet tries to smooth talk and reason with her, but when he brings up Sokka in a menacing way, she attacks him. Her valuing her brother over this smooth criminal is a great moment, somewhat making up for past terrorism this episode. Jet fights Aang and he's easily the most competent non-bender so far, maybe in the entire story. Only Tai Li or the Swordmaster would be at his level. The fight is very dynamic and avoids the framing problem. I love how Jet uses Chinese swords and I love how he hooks them together for longer range. He has such a cool fighting style. He actually almost beats Aang until Katara jumps in. Katara being the one to beat Jet is the best choice because she was the one that trusted him the most. After she freezes him, he gives the signal and they have to hope that Sokka is able to stop it, but he's not. The dam blows. Jet thinks he's won, but Sokka shows up and explains how he warned the villagers to leave thanks to the Chekhov's old man. The painted flashback is a nice stylistic choice. Sokka says, you became the traitor when you stopped protecting innocent people. That's cold. The crew flies away on Appa and we learn that sometimes Sokka's instincts are right. This is the best episode so far. There's a theme, which is you shouldn't hurt or sacrifice innocent people. There's a well-written antagonist that's a fake ally opponent. There's world building. There are great setups and payoffs. There's good action. There are interesting stakes. It's well-paced and eventful. Sokka's treated with respect. There's a great fight. It just made every shot. I don't think I have any issues with it. This honestly might be a perfect episode. Quick update, I've recently released the second volume of my manga, check it out when you have the chance. Now, episode 11. The episode starts with Katara and Sokka arguing like children. Aang settles this by making them switch roles. He also settles a beef between Appa and Momo. When the crew arrives at the canyon, the Great Divide, some weirdo shows up complaining about a tour guide. He wants the canyon guide to take his tribe next and is telling the crew to get in line. This is the Ganjin tribe. His voice sounds familiar and it's because he's Robin from Teen Titans. Then the Zhang tribe shows up and he hates them. The Earthbender guide shows up and the two tribes start arguing. Aang suggests that they travel together, but the two sides would rather die. Honestly, he should have just let them die. Some people are too stupid to help. Aang says he'll fly the sick and old on Appa and both sides agree. After a monster shows up, the guide breaks his arm, meaning he can't bend. Aang stops the tribes from beefing by splitting them up. He sends the siblings as spies, but they start getting along with the tribes because of how they make tents, which is a callback to the first argument. Both groups have different stories of why they hate the other tribe. Both stories paint the Telus tribe in a good light. The animation for Zhang's flashback looks like Studio Gainax slash trigger art and animation. The two tribes start fighting when they meet again and Aang learns that everyone brought food, which the tour specifically said not to do. Everyone's surrounded by canyon crawlers. The three fight back with their signature moves, but it's not enough, so Aang comes up with a plan to muzzle them. They all ride the monsters out of the canyon and send them back down when they get up. The two tribes actually work together for this, but then they start fighting again because of history. Aang then lies about the history and pretends to have known their ancestors, claiming that their feud was over a ball game. The tribes believe it, but Aang reveals to the crew that he made it up. People in the Avatar community hate this episode. On IMDb, this is rated a 6.9, which is the lowest rated episode. Is it really the worst episode? Let's see. It has a theme. Every problem can be solved peacefully. 
The only issue is that the last problem is solved by A, lying, which is a bad lesson for anyone, and B, by Aang abusing his status as the Avatar, not Groovy. I feel like if Aang solved the problem by saying that both versions of the past are probably wrong and they should just move on, this would have been an average Avatar episode. The episode's screen time is also plagued by the two tribes who are unbelievably annoying. If I'm being blunt, this episode is on the same level as episode 4. Characters acting childish and immature. Furthermore, episode 4 criticized Aang for abusing his status, but here, it's okay. I also think episode 5 in Omashu was less interesting. I also think the recap episode in season 3 is probably the worst episode, but I'll handle that when I get there. So I don't like this episode, but it's not a war crime. It's not the worst episode in Avatar, or even that far from the expected quality of season 1 so far. The episode starts with Aang having a nightmare due to the Avatar pressures, Katar being kind, and Sokka being funny. Meanwhile, Iroh and Zuko clash. Iroh senses a storm coming, but Zuko is headstrong and disregards safety in order to catch the Avatar. One of the crew members hears this. I just noticed, but Zuko's haircut looks terrible. The scar distracted me from that abomination. He needs a new barber. The crew coincidentally hear an old man and woman arguing about an incoming storm, which leads to Sokka getting a job since the team's broke. Back with Zuko. The lieutenant who heard Zuko earlier gives him attitude when he sees the clouds, which leads into an argument about respect. He's right about Zuko not showing respect to anyone around him. Zuko challenges him to a duel, and he accepts. That was cool, but Iroh stops them, like the wise adult figure he is. The old man gets on Aang's back about disappearing, which Aang was stressed out about earlier. Katara defending him shows her kindness, but the man is right. Then Aang really just flies away, just like he did a hundred years ago. Katara finds Aang, and he gives her his backstory. Her asking him about it shows her kindness again. We learned that the toys Aang picked as a child belonged to the past avatars, proving that he was the next avatar. That's cool world building. This leads to him getting isolated from his friends. Monk Kyoto was easy on Aang, while the other monks believed he should be training. This argument caused Aang to be sent away to the Eastern Temple, which is why he ran away. Aang gets livid about this in the present, and his tattoos even begin to glow. After leaving during a storm, he ended up crashing in the water and making the iceberg. Katara shows her positivity by saying that Aang would have died if he stayed, and he's needed now. Meanwhile, Iroh gives Zuko's backstory to the soldiers. His haircut looked better back then. Here, Zuko is cheerful, a stark contrast to the present version. Iroh warns him not to speak, but Zuko is too passionate and does so anyway when someone suggests sacrificing men. This resulted in an Agni Kai, a fire duel, against his father. Zuko refused to fight and was burned by Ozai. Azula could be seen smiling in the crowd next to Iroh. I never noticed this. In just a second of screen time, they already show that she's a psycho. Ozai banished Zuko because he refused to fight and gave him the responsibility of capturing the Avatar. In the present, the old lady from before asks the crew to save the old man because of the storm. Zuko sees the helmsman in trouble, and he and the lieutenant save him. Iroh redirects lightning coming for the ship. This is the first time lightning bending appears. It's insane how many details are previewed in this season before they become important. Zuko sees Aang during the storm, but he decides to let him go for the safety of his crew, showing that he values the lives of his crew over restoring his honor, his primary motivation. Excellent writing. Aang saves them, but he falls in water, mirroring the past. He enters the Avatar state and makes a wind bubble, but this time, he brings everyone to safety rather than freezing himself. Zuko apologizes to Iroh for the first time. The old man, who previously complained about Aang disappearing, now thanks Aang for saving him in the present. This was a phenomenal episode, almost as good as Jet. Aang's character arc, and maybe the theme of the episode, is to look on the bright side. The characterization is great, the flashbacks add layers to the two focus characters and the plot is a great medium for exploring the development of the characters and how they've either changed or stayed the same. From the title alone, I know this episode is going to be good. It starts with Zhao being promoted and acquiring elite archers while a man in a blue mask spies on him. On the crew's side, Sokka is sick and Katara is getting sick, so Aang goes to get medicine. He shows his super speed again. Zuko is losing hope because Zhao's resources are giving him the edge in the race to capture Aang. Aang goes to get the frogs the old lady told him about, but the Yuyan archers attack. He finds the frogs while fighting, but is eventually captured. These archers are definitely some of the most deadly non-benders. Aang is captured by Zhao, but the man in the blue demon mask shows up again. The blue spirit uses his espionage skills to sneak into the fortress and even defeat a few benders. He's also one of the most dangerous non-benders. Aang loses his frogs, but blue frees him and helps him escape. The spinning camera when Aang dodges the spear was cool. There's some shaky cam when the blue spirit fights. 
Zhao lets them out when Blue threatens to kill Aang because he needs them alive, but he shoots Blue with his snipers. Aang learns that this is Zuko and he takes him to safety. When Zuko wakes up in the forest, Aang talks about how he had a Fire Nation friend before the war, but Zuko immediately attacks him. Aang runs away and heals his friends with the frogs. This episode has no theme, but the plot is great, like the Roku episode. Something interesting, something interesting is always happening, and Zuko going against the Fire Nation to free Aang was an interesting concept and fleshed out his character as someone who's desperate to achieve his goals. It's similar to Robin becoming Red X. This episode starts with Aang's horrible game. He weaves a necklace for Katara to replace her old one, but little does he know that it had sentimental value, meaning that it can't be replaced. Aang starts drooling over her, and Sokka makes it worse by calling this out, and then she friend zones him. What's with cartoon characters having no game, especially the teens? There are so many I can think of that have atrocious game. The crew meets a guy with great confidence due to his fortune being told by Aunt Wu. Sokka's skeptical nature returns despite evidence suggesting that Wu can tell the future. At Wu's, an assistant named Meng falls for the mediocre Aang for no reason. It's revealed that she was foretold to marry a big-eared man, so she thinks that's Aang. When Katara is having her fortune read, Aang decides to be corny and spies on her. The powerful bender part makes him happy and leads to a funny joke with him and Sokka. When Aang's fortune is read, he only cares about romance, so Wu seems to make something up for him. A new conflict arises when the villagers reveal that they rely on Wu's prediction about volcanic eruptions rather than checking it themselves. Aang shows some horrible game again. Wu predicts that the village is safe from the volcano by reading the clouds. Sokka continues to remain skeptical of the fortunes, and Katara is unusually interested in romance in this episode. After being asked, Sokka gives Aang the advice of not being too nice, but Sokka thinks he likes Mang. This leads to a funny bit. Katara is strangely obsessed with fortunes, but the papaya bit was funny too. Aang tries the advice, but it flops. He goes to the volcano to find a special flower with Sokka, but they learn that the volcano is active. They try to warn the people, but they are ignored. Part of the problem with a lot of these episodes is when the inciting incident happens, and I'm just realizing this. There is no driving external conflict for this episode until the 16th minute. The characters are just exploring the area and the idea of fortune telling. There's some internal conflict with Aang wanting to get with Katara and Sokka not believing the fortune telling, but it's not strong enough to drive the episode. Only once the volcano becomes relevant two thirds into the episode is there a solid external conflict. Episode 1 did the same thing and I described it as loitering. Only once Aang activates the trap at the end is there an external conflict. Aang's half in episode 3 doesn't even have an external conflict. Episode 4 introduces its external conflict after halfway as well. The first half is just petty internal conflicts. Episode 12, The Storm, has the same formula of internal first half, external second half, but the difference is that the internal conflict is really good here. It explains Aang and Zuko's backgrounds, which fleshes them out as characters, and then it shows how they've changed through a character arc in the second half. While Aang steals the cloud reading book, he has a conversation with Mang, where she's a reflection of him, both in an unrequited love situation. She gives him the book, and the crew manipulate the clouds with water bending. This is a callback to when Aang discovered what clouds were made of in episode 7. Once Wu sees the clouds, everyone believes them. Sokka makes a plan to dig trenches, but that's not enough. Aang uses airbending to solidify some of the lava, and Sokka calls him a powerful bender, which piques Katara's interest. The episode ends with the theme, you can shape your own destiny. This episode was mediocre. Katara and Aang are being forced together through divine intervention, and I hate it. They have nearly no natural chemistry. Besides that, the episode didn't get interesting until the volcano arrived, which was like two thirds in. But even that wasn't that interesting. The theme is executed decently. Overall, an okay episode. This episode starts with the crew finding hints leading them to Sokka and Katara's dad. His whereabouts are an ongoing mystery throughout the show. Meanwhile, Suko's ship gets attacked by the goth girl. Her animal finds a stowaway on the ship due to its scent. Iroh is a little too impressed by her. I can't blame him, he has good eyes. Zuko and Iroh are comedy gold. Sokka has a flashback about his dad, which hints at their strong connection. Katara is always talking about their mom, but for Sokka, it's their dad. Bato, a man their father knew, shows up and tells him that their dad's in the Earth Kingdom. Aang is being ignored and left out more and more. Zuko gets the goth girl to track the scent of Katara's necklace. She calls Katara his girlfriend. Aang hears that a message from their father is coming soon and that the siblings would love to go, but he misses the part where Sokka prioritizes taking Aang to the North Pole. This is a great show of value for Sokka. He has the option to see his father, something he really wants, but he sacrifices it to help Aang save the world. Aang intercepts Bato's message, but he keeps it a secret because he doesn't want to be left behind. 
Once again, a character arc comes from a character acting poorly. If he discussed it with them, things would have been resolved, but he had to act immaturely. This is somewhat understandable due to his age, but he's shown to be wise and mature in other episodes. The old lady with the medicine appears again when Zuko and the goth are looking for the avatar. So does Aunt Wu's place. Meanwhile, Aang continues hiding his secret and Bato decides to take Sokka on a rite of passage that he missed out on. The trio work together to dodge rocks on a boat. When they complete it and trust is brought up, Aang reveals his secret. When they find the map, all of them ditch Aang. He messed up but he came clean the same day. The way they all reacted was wrong. They actually pack their bags and part ways, but Aang handles this really well. The fire squad starts closing in. After hearing a wolf separated from the pack, Bato, young Sokka, and current Aang are all poetically connected and Sokka decides to go back for Aang. Aang learns that Zuko is chasing Katara. When they're found, the goth girl calls Katara Zuko's girlfriend again. The siblings are captured and Aang comes to save them. Appa fights for the first time and Aang vs Zuko happens again. The framing issue is almost entirely gone and they are equals. During the fight, Zuko uses an attack that Aang then copies with his element. That was cool. Appa airbends with his tail while Iroh fools around, stealing a perfume. Aang sees Katara's necklace and there's a very Jackie Chan-esque sequence of Aang dodging using the well. This is definitely one of the best fight scenes so far. The animation is regular but the framing is really good and the creativity and choreography are excellent. This is the first time Aang has consciously waterbent against Zuko. When the water siblings are healed with sense, Sokka makes a plan to interrupt the pet's sense of smell, showing his intelligence again. The pet is Nyla and the owner is Jun. The plan works and Nyla paralyzes Zuko and Jun. Zuko and Iroh have one last funny bit, with the latter pretending to be paralyzed to be near Jun. He has more game than Aang. This duel's, this duel's a lot funnier than Aang's crew. In the ending, Sokka says Aang is their family too, and Aang returns Katara's necklace. Then she says, would you give him a kiss for me? This episode is laying it on thick when it comes to Katara and Zuko. It's no wonder why some people ship them over Katara and Aang, and it only gets worse. Don't get me started on the season 2 finale. She does kiss Aang right after saying this though, which is strange. She friendzoned him last time. Actually several times. And then we live in America, where platonic kisses are nearly non-existent. The only type of kiss that isn't romantic is a parental one. And even past a certain age, that's still kinda strange. So if she's not fully into him, why would she do that? She's playing with this boy. Anyway, this was a really good episode. I like the conflict between the crew, it was understandable. The fight was really good and made use of an earlier plot point. The way they won was smart. I like June. <laughs> Zuko and Iroh did their thing. The plot was eventful. Appa was a beast. Just an overall great episode. I think the theme was family matters. I might be reaching there. I wish Appa fought more, especially since Sky Bisons were the original benders. The season is getting better. In the past 6 episodes, I really liked 4. Sokka is hungry again at the start. How are they always broke? They should learn from One Piece and get money from the people they save, like they did in the Heibai episode. They see a festival with firebenders and Aang thinks he can find a teacher. Aang's wanted poster from the Blue Spirit is shown alongside the new poster for the Blue Spirit himself. A poster of a white haired man with a scar is zoomed in on. Some man spies on them when they head to the festival. He's in the crowd spying on them again before Aang stupidly exposes himself as the avatar. His maturity and intelligence really bounces around from episode to episode. The man helps them escape and the bison whistle brings Appa to rescue them. He airbends again. The guy who saved them is a former fire soldier. He serves Zhang Zhang, a high ranking firebender who abandoned the nation. Aang wants to learn from him. Sokka is against this, but Katara supports him. This might burn her later. Zhang <laughs> Zhang Zhang doesn't want to teach Aang because he has to master the other elements in order. The order he has to learn them in is the same as the avatar cycle. Aang meets JJ anyway, and he's the same man in the poster. JJ refuses to teach Aang because he has no discipline and isn't ready, but Roku steps in like a boss and forces JJ to obey. Aang's like a kid tattling to his parents. During Aang's training, he's very impatient, he just wants to shoot fire. Then JJ talks about a former disciple without discipline and it comes to Zhao, who is hunting Aang again. Aang tries to show that he's patient, so JJ starts to teach him firebending, but Aang goes back to being impatient. He's instructed to keep a leaf from burning, but he lets it burn and starts playing with the fire. This leads to him burning Katara. Sokka rightfully gets pissed after all of his warnings. She accidentally heals herself with water. This will become much bigger later. Zhang Zhang holds off Xiao as Katara gets Aang, who promises to never firebend again. Xiao calls him the Deserter, the title of the episode. Aang fights Xiao for the first time and notices his lack of self-control, something we learned from JJ. Aang taunts the Admiral and gets him to burn his ships. Smart strategy. When the crew flies away, Katara uses healing again. This was a solid episode.
The theme is be patient, but Aang is extremely immature here. The plot after the festival is good, and so is the action. The crew hears about flying people in the sky recently, so Aang thinks airbenders might still be alive. The optimism and pessimism of the siblings is shown again. Aang finds the gliders and is salty that they're appropriating his culture. Initially, he says the kid, Teo, doesn't have spirit. When racing Teo, they do a spiraling maneuver like in Top Gun Maverick. The temple has been colonized and ruined for advanced tech, which upsets Aang even more. This one is understandable. He actually gets mad enough to start wrecking stuff. Sokka is really interested in the technology, and the siblings are mostly unaffected by the changes. Aang doesn't want to open the airbender door because it's the only untouched place in the sacred temple. The mechanist shows Sokka the gas problem. I like how parts of his character design are explained through past events, like his fingers and eyebrows. When they go gliding later, Aang changes his mind and says Teo has spirit. This allows him to also change his mind about opening the door. Sokka and the mechanist come up with a solution to the gas leak problem, rotten eggs, while Aang opens the door. I like how the door was used. It's a symbol of Aang's character arc. When he's opposed to the people in the temple, the door stays closed. When he accepts them, the door is opened. That's great writing. Inside are Fire Nation weapons. It's revealed that the mechanist made a deal with the Fire Nation to protect the temple. This is the midpoint. Aang disrupts the deal and causes the nation to attack. Once again, internal first half, external second half. The execution of this style is done well here once again. The internal conflict is actually interesting and strong enough to drive the plot forward. The heroes decide to use the gliders and the new balloons that Sokka helped create to fight back. I like that Sokka's been given mechanical knowledge. It adds another use for his character combat-wise. The war starts, but the balloons are late. This is a setup. The animation during the action looks great as usual. I like the third-person shots of the gliders flying. The vehicles are CG, but they look good. Teo's dad knowing the weakness of the vehicles makes sense because he builds weapons for the nation, but it having to do with water is a little too convenient and out of nowhere. However, this weakness is never explained and Katara just decides to use ice to dismantle them. Once the gliders run out of bombs, the war balloons show up. Good setup and payoff. The gas and rotten egg combo comes back and Sokka throws the fuel down there, creating an explosion. Another good setup and payoff. The nation retreats but the balloon goes down, so Aang and Sokka work together to get them all to safety. In the resolution, Aang is fine with the new temple dwellers and uses a hermit crab metaphor, an animal that was shown earlier. The balloon ends up in the hands of the Fire Nation. If this affects the actual continuity, that would be amazing. This episode was also solid. It had good setups in the first half that paid off in the second. Aang's frustration was understandable and in character. And guess what? His arc was a change in belief rather than eliminating a bad character trait. That's what I said I preferred before when covering episode 4. The theme would be, change can be good. Sokka was very competent here as well. The only negative would be that the first half was a little boring compared to the second. The crew is bickering about flying for two days before waterbenders attack them. Xiao scheming shows the attention to detail. The landscape of the water tribe makes it a difficult place to attack. I like how it's made of ice and rivers, which requires water bending to get around. It's just like Omashu. That's a great use of the setting. Sokka sees the princess and is already in love. That's about to be his second girl. Her name is Yue, and 16 is the marrying age. That's kinda young dog. Master Paku is introduced as a teacher, and the animation is clean. Sokka's game is a little shaky, but Katara's not helping. I hate people who do that. When you see someone trying to spit game, unless you're after the person they're talking to, let them land. Sokka's game was trash. Paku becomes Aang's teacher, but he has an attitude. Meanwhile, Zhao not only takes Zuko's crew, but he also learns that Zuko is the blue spirit. Paku refuses to teach Katara because she's a woman, and they heal, not fight. That is part of his culture. Paku has some quick wit. Aang was willing to quit if Katara can't learn, which shows his loyalty, but Katara makes him realize how stupid that is, and that he needs to learn waterbending. Sokka's game has improved, and he hits on Yue, scoring himself a date. I just noticed this, but all of the water tribe people are dark skinned or tan, and a lot of them have K's in their name. Zhao works with the pirates from the other episode to screw Zuko over. He's a clever schemer. Katara and Aang both learn from their respective teachers. Katara's necklace is highlighted and the teacher reveals that she knew Kana, Katara's grandmother. Kana was born here and she was engaged, but left to the southern tribe for some reason. The necklace was carved by the person she was engaged to. This is a setup. Aro leaves with the crew and invites Zuko out, but he refuses. This becomes a mistake because the pirates come to bomb the ship and Zuko barely makes it out alive. That's great repurposing, the pirates and the blasting jelly. Aro thinks his nephew is dead. In the water tribe, Yue suddenly rejects Sokka for some reason. When the crew is venting, Sokka the genius tells Aang to teach Katara what he's learned, and Katara thanks him by leaving him unhappy. It'd be your own tribe. 
Paku catches them and refuses to teach Aang due to the disrespect. It's crazy how just last episode, Aang was mad at his culture being disrespected, but now he's disrespecting the tribe's culture. Instead of apologizing, Katara challenges Paku to a water Agni Kai. Earlier in this episode, she was mature enough to tell Aang not to ruin his chance of learning from a teacher, but now she's ruining his chance by refusing to apologize for breaking the rules. That's ignorant on her part and inconsistent on the writer's part, unless she's written to be a hypocrite. Iroh believes that the pirates killed Zuko and joins Zhao in his invasion. Katara vs Paku happens. The cut of Katara running towards the camera looks amazing, but her strategy is so stupid. She just ran into his attack. What was she thinking? I love how the movements are based on martial arts. It adds personality to it. Water is based on Tai Chi. Earth is Hong Gar. Fire is Northern Shaolin. Air is Bakwa Zhang. The animation looks great and there's some motion blur. I love when characters who use the same element manipulate their opponent's attack. Katara does that when Paku creates the ring. I also love the use of ice. Changing the state of water's matter is creative. Katara makes Paku's water vanish into thin air. The counter dynamic happens again when Paku makes an ice wall and Katara turns it into water. Then she starts doing hand-to-hand -hand combat for some reason and Paku just tosses her with water. Again, what was she thinking? I get that the writers want to make her look outclassed, but you don't have to dumb her down for that. After more action, she runs in for the third time and gets pushed back with water. I like how she moves already made ice structures and how Paku counters by turning it into snow. Then the action gets even better and the counters increase. The best part of the fight is Paku riding on ice then turning Katara's water attack into his water ride, turning it into an ice ride and striking. It was so smooth and beautifully shot. Her necklace comes off after this. Paku ends the fight by trapping Katara in icicles. I don't know why she didn't just turn it back into water. Paku recognizes the necklace and it's revealed that Kana was to marry him. Check off's necklace. With the Fire Nation, Zuko is bruised but in Fire Nation armor and Iroh's working with him. I love this duo. When Paku talks about the arranged marriage, Yue runs away, implying she's also in an arranged marriage. Kana ran away because of this, and Katara calls his tribe's customs stupid. She's so ignorant sometimes. Seriously, imagine calling someone else's customs stupid. This 180 on the writer's part is insane. Episode 17 is about respecting culture, but this episode is about disrespecting culture. So are they saying only respect culture when it matches your culture and values? Ridiculous. Sokka thinks he's being dumped and handles it well, but after getting his second kiss, she explains. Paku decides to teach Katara. Zhao's fleet is shown approaching the north. This episode is actually better than the last. Sokka and Katara have their own plot lines that are interesting and paid off to a degree. The Paku plot twist was good. The fight was one of the best in the cartoon so far. Two overarching narratives are coming closer to their conclusion. Aang learning water and the nation trying to capture the Avatar. It lacks a theme and the perspective on culture is inconsistent along with Katara's maturity. But those don't bring the episode down enough. Katara has become one of Paku's best students while Aang is goofing off. Sokka's game improves as he takes Yue on Appa. His Yip Yip is a callback to episode 2. While up there, they see the black snow, a warning sign of the Fire Nation. That's cool. I like how early the major conflict is starting this time. It's 5 minutes in. Yue says she can't hang out with Sokka because she can't stay friends with him. This is a setup. The guy giving the speech saying that some of the people will vanish from the tribe is dark, but a clever way of slipping in the maturity of the consequences of war. During the speech, he says the spirit of the moon and ocean. I like Sokka joining the war. He's always been obsessed with being a warrior since his dad was a great one. The Sokka and Yue tension remains. The music did a good job of amplifying the emotions in the scene. I like Aang trying to right the wrong of abandoning his people by staying for the tribe. It shows character development. The shot of his back and the pan up is nearly identical to the one in the intro. The intro's motif plays as well. The war starts and the animation is fantastic. The guy with the chained hammers has a cool fighting style. Sokka calls out the fake looking fire suits and gets into an argument with Han. Sokka also already knows their commander, showing that he's a step ahead again, very competent. Then it's revealed that Han is Yue's fiance. The war strategies are good. Iroh advises Zhao to stop because the waterbenders get strength from the moon, even more when it's a full moon. This is a cool detail. Zhao takes the advice. I love the immense weight that being the avatar comes with. Aang is discouraged because everyone expects him to beat the Fire Nation, but there are too many ships. But you're the avatar, I'm just one kid. I felt that. He hasn't even mastered two elements but he's expected to take on an entire fleet. It's rare to see heroes get overwhelmed by their duties and I think it's a cool concept. Iroh saying he thinks of Zuko as his son is powerful. This might be the first time they say he lost his son, which is why he quit the war. I don't remember, but I like how this piece of history is sprinkled throughout the season. Iroh even hugs him. I love this duo. Iroh mentions Breath of Fire as he leaves. This is a setup. Zuko begins his plan. 
Meanwhile, Sokka gets into a fight with Han because he doesn't care about Yue. The old man takes Sokka off the mission and Han is underestimating Zhao. That's the setup. Zuko sees animals diving into the water and follows them to sneak into the tribe. Clever. Yue says the moon was the first waterbender. This is the first time an element's bending origin is revealed. Earth is revealed in the Earth Book and fire in the fire. She also mentions the spirit of the moon and ocean once again, and this gives Aang an idea. Their plan is to talk to the spirits. They go to the center of spiritual energy so Aang can enter the spirit world. When Zuko reaches the air, he uses the fire breath to warm himself up. Zuko nearly drowns on his way in, but he successfully infiltrates the North Pole. Sokka is given the role of guarding Yue, which will bring him closer to closing up his plotline. Aang snapping at the girls was funny. When Aang enters the spirit world by looking at the koi fish, Zuko shows up. The animation here is elite. I love the one point perspective and foreshortening as Zuko moves closer. It's a unique camera angle. It's also slightly a Dutch angle since the camera is tilted. The fire is rendered in a cooler way. Katara shows off her improvement by landing hits without taking any. Her increase in power might also be due to the full moon. I love Zuko's line in the iceberg. You little peasant, you found a master haven't you? Zuko busts out and the cool camera angle returns with even more of a tilt. There's a camera shake and motion blur, my favorite duo. This time, Zuko is dodging all the attacks. The close range exchange was cool, but I noticed that sometimes, Katara's water just comes from the ground rather than a source. Zuko gets hit when trying to grab Aang, and then loses. I don't know what he was thinking, he should have beaten Katara first, because even if he managed to grab him, he'd still have to fight Katara, now while holding Aang, putting him at a disadvantage. Katara soloing Zuko is a huge step up for her. At daybreak, Zuko melts out for round 2 and his fire trumps are water. I guess the moon was giving her a boost and the sun gives him a boost. You rise with the moon, I rise with the sun. That was a good line, but he just one-shots her. No way she did all of that work just to be one-shotted. Zuko got hit multiple times and got back up. The riders did her dirty. Zuko is long gone with Aang as the nation invades. He carries him through the snow as the episode ends. This is one of the best episodes. Zuko and Iroh were great. The action at the start and end were great. The framing problem is mostly gone. Aang's characterization and the solution of the spirits to the problem of the fleet are excellent. Sokka and Yue's plotline is coming to an end. Katara got to show off her new skills. There was good world building and strategizing. The conflict started early and lasted for the whole episode, making it entertaining. There's no character arc or theme, but that's fine. The rest makes up for it. This is the last episode of Book 1, Water. Aang enters the spirit world and is different. Last time, he was in the human world as a ghost. Now, he's in a completely different world. He ends up meeting Roku there. Roku gives exposition on the moon and ocean. There are spirits who've crossed into the mortal realm. He sends them to Ko, the face stealer, for answers. He's not allowed to show emotions. In the real world, stupid Zuko is carrying Aang through a blizzard and nearly dies. He finds a cave and stops there. He uses the fire breath to warm up again. While talking to Aang, he mentions his sister, who everything came easy to. I like how they build her up. My father said she was born lucky. He says I was lucky to be born. That was hard. Who wrote this? This was written by Aaron E. Has, who has written 7 of the episodes so far. He's the head writer and co-producer of the show. Iroh sets up a ticking clock with the Chekhov's gun when he says they have to win before the full moon rises, or else the waterbenders will be undefeatable. Zhao says he intends to move the moon before comedically defeating Han. Zhao knows about the mortal forms of the spirits from an underground library in the Earth Kingdom. This has a whole episode centered around it in Season 2, so the setup is amazing. He wants to kill the spirits, but Iroh, a spiritual person, says that it's a bad idea. Zhao even says that Iroh's journeyed into the spirit world. Aang meets Ko and this guy's nightmare fuel. He not only looks creepy, but he keeps changing his face while talking with eerie music. He even says that he stole the face of a previous avatar's loved one. He's a menace. He stressed Aang out so much that his body in the real world had to take a breath. Ko's riddles almost have Aang get his face stolen, but he leaves with the knowledge that the koi fish are the mortal forms. Heibai brings Aang back to the mortal world. Good repurposing. I love how the waterbenders use their location for combat. The spinning shot of Paku fighting fire soldiers looks cool. It also led to a smooth transition. The animation in general just looks great. Aang returns to his body, which allows Katara to find him. Zuko tries to fight Katara in the snow with a full moon and gets one-shotted. Now he looks lame. Aang decides to save him. Xiao bags one of the spirits, turning the sky red and removing all waterbending powers. Here, Yue explains how the moon spirit saved her life. This is a setup. Aang and even Iroh pull up to stop Zhao. Iroh's tenfold line was epic and is one of the few times he's been shown to be serious. Zhao puts it back but then kills it immediately, turning the sky grey. This was an epic moment. Great directing and music. 
Then Iroh starts shooting at him, and the flames are the only thing colored. Iroh takes out the soldiers as Zhao flees. Zuko escapes during this. Everything is grayscale, but Yue's eyes are still blue, which is a cool way of showing her importance and connection to the spirit. Aang enters the avatar state and says it's not over, before fusing with the remaining spirit. The whole scene of him lighting up and sinking into the water was epic. The water turns blue, and he turns into a fish kaiju. The waterbenders bow while the firebenders are destroyed with water. This is like a biblical massacre. The music really creates the perfect mood. Zuko finds Zhao, and their plotline comes to a climax. The animation, ankles, and blur all look great. Iru is so wise, and he realizes that Yue could give her life to the moon spirit. She turns it to the moon spirit and kisses Sokka one last time. Brief tangent. When Sokka told Zuko that his girlfriend turned into the moon, his that's rough buddy made it sound like he didn't understand, but he was here. He knew that the moon spirit died and came back somehow. Anyway, color comes back to the world and Aang goes back to normal. Zuko vs Zhao continues and Zuko is still winning. The water monster's hand grabs Zhao and Zuko tries to save him, but he lets himself be taken. He presumably drowns, which is kinda dark. I like the way this was wrapped up. Zuko got his win, but he showed that he was still the better person when he tried to save Zhao. I also like how Zhao was this season's villain and was defeated in the final episode. The war has ended and Paku decides to head south and makes Katara Aang's teacher. Wait, what? Wasn't Aang better at waterbending than her in the pirate episode? Now she's master level, and he's not, despite them learning from the same teacher? This is unreal. The master wouldn't have lost to Zuko in one move, though. I like how Yue's father is proud, but sad. It shows emotional complexity. She saved the day, but she's gone. Zuko deciding not to chase Aang once again shows character development. In the last scene, Azula is shown receiving a mission from Ozai. That's the end of season 1. This episode was better than the last. I have the same review as that one, except multiplied. The season had a rocky start, but it improved as the story went on. The plots in the first few episodes were boring and uneventful. 1 through 5 all have this issue. The conflict wasn't strong enough, and it felt like the crew was just fooling around. There was also the occasional issue of external conflicts being introduced late into the episode, making the first half boring. But episode 6, Imprisoned, is where it started improving. It only ever came back down in The Great Divide and The Fortune Teller. But even these lows weren't as bad as the start. I love the overarching plot of Aang having to find a teacher for each element so that he can max out his avatar status and beat the Fire Lord before Sosa's Comet. This book gave him water, and each season, he'll get closer to that end goal. It's a great way of tracking progress. A mix on the characters. Aang and Katara do absolutely nothing for me. They're just there and are occasionally entertaining, but also annoying. They have no X-Factor or charisma. I think one of the problems is their main character traits, which makes them feel bland. Aang's main trait is his childishness, but it only appears often in the first couple of episodes where he wants to ride animals and vehicles. Outside of that, he's not that childish. Plus, this trait isn't pushed that far. Think about it. After Omashu, what does he do childish? He gets distracted by a butterfly and imprisoned. He goes to a fire festival and blows his identity. He rushes to learn fire, and he slacks off during water training and makes a snowman. That's all I can think of. Two of these are little gags, and two of them are flaws that have to be fixed. I prefer the gags because they treat his trait neutrally rather than negatively. When his childishness is negative, he needs to abandon it, making him blander. But those two gags are just short scenes. He's not like that through the whole episode. As for Katara, her main traits are her kindness and her anger. Her kindness appears more often, but isn't pushed to 11 like Starfire from Teen Titans. It's subdued. It also stops showing up towards the end. The last time I remember her being kind in a major way was episode 12, The Storm. Her anger shows up in times like episode 1, The Scroll, or with Paku, but again, not often. And considering Aang and her are the two main characters, this is a bit of a problem. She's also the most annoying main character in the story, and sometimes very hypocritical, without acknowledgement from the writers, making me like her even less. But I like Sokka and love Zuko and Iroh. They have colorful and entertaining personalities. If you look at Sokka's traits, they're done better. His traits are his caution slash pessimism, and his comedy. He's funny in nearly every episode, and his pessimism makes up a large part of his character. There are episodes where this trait takes the foreground, like 1 and 2, Jet, the fortune teller, and the deserter. It's not in every episode, but it feels more prominent and stronger than the other characters' traits. Zuko and Iroh are the greatest examples. Zuko is serious and angry. Nearly every scene he has shows this. His seriousness is always there when he's hunting the Avatar, which he does in basically all his episodes. His anger is also ever-present, and both traits are exaggerated to 11. He hunts Aang at all costs, and is almost always angry for no reason. His anger always makes him a fun duo with Iroh, 
and is shown just as much. Iroh's main trait is being calm. His calmness is basically in every scene and is highlighted when he's with Zuko. It is sometimes exaggerated to the point where it even becomes laziness. The constant presence of a unique trait and the exaggeration of it prevent them from ever feeling bland. Zuko and Iroh are so good that I honestly think this season could have focused on them as the main characters and their hunt for the Avatar, while the good guys are secondary characters that sometimes have their own B-plots. Zuko is just a much better character than Aang, in personality, goal, backstory, values, and character arc. The characterization in the show is usually good. Characters have consistent personalities, but sometimes they act out of character, which leads to character arcs. Early in the story, a few arcs revolve around characters acting stupidly to cause conflict. The Kyoshi episode was the worst example. Other examples are the Water Scroll and Bato. I prefer when the flaw is actually a believable part of the character rather than a tool for the episode. Not all the episodes had character arcs, but when the plot is strong enough, like the Solstice Part 2, Blue Spirit, or both sieges, it doesn't need an arc. One more thing with characters. If Gotara was allowed to go from being a bending amateur to a bending master, why is Sokka never allowed to have this ascension? I know he gets a swordsmanship teacher in Season 3, but even then, he's not a master. A master combatant would look like Jet, Suki, Tai Li, or his master. It would have been so cool if he rose to their level. Such a missed opportunity in the series as a whole. Themes, which are usually connected to an arc, aren't always present. The first theme was in episode 4 or 5. Where they are, they can be good. Imprisoned and Jet had the strongest themes in terms of message and execution. The rest were okay. The setting was great. A bit of every single one of the four nations were shown. Each incorporated bending into their architecture and technology. Bending is a simple but cool power system. Spirits, avatars, and reincarnation were also fleshed out a little. The world really feels lived in. The action started off shaky with the framing problem, but around the episode Jet, it was fixed. The action looks amazing, easily better than Teen Titans. Initially, I thought each had its own strengths, but by the end of the season, Avatar had far outclassed Teen Titans. It constantly has shake and blur. It has choreography based on real martial arts, and it has great camera angles, animation, and compositing. It's almost anime level. I think the major advantage this has is the 1v1s. A lot of Teen Titans fights were the 5 throwing attacks at a villain until one can finally beat it. But here, the fights are written as detailed exchanges between two combatants. The power system also allows for the fights to be more visually entertaining. The character designs are more detailed and that makes the action look slightly better. The visuals in general just look superior to any cartoon I've seen. The earlier episodes had the major issue of bathos, but again, by episode 6, that was gone. The story went from being unable to take anything seriously to having menacing, dark, and serious moments. The only bathos I can remember after episode 6 is when Zhao defeated Han, but that lasted a second. The joke was set up, and it was inconsequential. The best episodes of the season were Jet, The Siege of the North, Avatar Roku, The Blue Spirit, The Storm, Bato of the Water Tribe, and Imprisoned. That's it for book 1 of Avatar. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and help me revolutionize the manga industry by buying my manga and spreading the word. All important links will be in the description.